Module 4, The Leadership of Susan B. Anthony. You're reading The Hope Chest by Karen Schwabach, Chapter 3. Homework. Read Chapter 3, pages 31 through 41, then record summary notes in the left box at the bottom of the Reader's Guide for The Hope Chest, Chapters 3, Meeting Myrtle. Number two, as you reread the chapter, look for unfamiliar words whose meaning you may be able to infer by using synonyms and antonyms. Number three, use sticky notes to mark the page where the word is and write the synonym and antonym for that word. Here is some background information before you read chapter three. The following items are referenced in the chapter, so you need to know what they are before you begin. The Red Army advance on Warsaw. It was the Soviet Russian army attacking Poland. The Soviets were bigger and stronger than Poland, but Poland won. In the following months, several more Polish victories saved Poland's independence and led to a peace treaty with the Russians. The Volstead Act a law created to enforce the 18th Amendment, which made drinking, selling, or possessing liquor a crime. Chapter 3, Meeting Myrtle. Page 31, Chapter 3, Meeting Myrtle. The train was stuck for a long time in Scranton because of some sort of trouble on the tracks. It was evening when it pulled into New York the station was huge. Violet bid a hasty farewell to Mrs. Renwick and sped away, trying to look like she knew where she was going. She was conscious that other people had suitcases and even trunks, which colored men in dark uniforms and red caps wheeled along for them on carts. She had nothing at all but her letters from Chloe and 67 cents pinned in a handkerchief inside her blouse. The train station went on and on, its stone floors and high vaulted ceilings echoing with the voices of hundreds of people. Now what? It was hard to think straight with all this noise. New York was somehow much louder than Violet. Turn the page. Page 32. New York was somehow much larger than Violet had imagined. Violet looked over her shoulder to see if Mrs. Renwick was still watching her, but Mrs. Renwick was gone. Violet was glad, but also scared. She needed to ask directions, and she did not know how. A policeman in a blue uniform stood beside an iron pillar, swinging his stick. Speaking to adults was a dangerous business. One wrong word could get you sent to your room without dinner. How did you address a police officer? Girls weren't supposed to say, sir. That was for boys and the wrong sort of people. You should call men Mr. Something. But she didn't know the police officer's name, and speaking without being spoken to was always wrong. Violet took a deep breath. If she didn't break any of these rules, she was going to be stuck in this train station forever. Excuse me, sir, can you tell me the way out of this train station? The policeman leaned down and peered at her as if she were very small. The exit's at the top of the stairs, little girl. Where's your mama? She's, my sister's waiting for me, Violet said hastily. Uh-huh. The policeman looked suspicious. Well, why don't you just stand right here with me and we'll wait for your sister together. Violet couldn't think what to do. If she ran away, the policeman might chase after her. She stood beside him, thinking fast. How was she going to get away so she could find Henry Street and Chloe? Page 33. What does your sister look like? The policeman asked. She's tall and, oh, there she is. Violet took off running, calling over her shoulder. Thank you, sir. Violet hadn't seen Chloe, of course, but it fooled the policeman. She ran up the stone staircase and squeezed into the brass and glass revolving door next to a young woman in a green hat, topped with a tall, upright ruffle of starched silk like a crown. She smiled up at the woman adoringly, in case the policeman was still watching her. With a thumping swish, the revolving door dumped Violet out onto the sidewalk. It was much darker out than she'd expected. It was evening of a long August day, but the street was a canyon between high granite and cast iron skyscrapers, and the sun didn't reach the bottom. Motor cars, street cars, and horse-drawn wagons rumbled by, 
guided by electric or kerosene lamps mounted on the front. People pushed past Violet, and she stumbled back against the granite wall of the train station. New York was loud and fast and scary, and she didn't like it. Hey! A boy in knee breeches pushed her. This is my section. Shove off. He picked up an armload of newspapers and threw himself into the crowd, shouting, Extra! Extra! Red Army advances on Warsaw! Poland sues for peace! The crowd tossed the boy around like a colonel of... Turn the page. Page 34. The crowd tossed the boy around like a kernel of popcorn in a shaking pan until he popped back out. He bumped up against the wall and shook his fist at Violet. I said, get lost. Go find your own sidewalk. He shoved Violet again and she stumbled out into the moving crowd. Terrified, Violet struggled to stay upright. The crowd caught her and carried her along. She didn't know where she was going. She wanted to ask if anybody knew the way to Henry Street, but nobody even looked at her. Once she was knocked off the sidewalk into the street, and there was a squeal of brakes and the blast of a long, curled brass car, car horn, Violet scrambled hastily up onto the sidewalk and tried to stay closer to the walls. She felt like Dorothy caught up in the cyclone, or Alice falling down the rabbit hole. Sometimes the crowd crossed streets, and she could tell because the sidewalks beneath her feet turned to asphalt road and then back to, into sidewalk again. Violet could see nothing but the shoulders of men's coats and women's dresses and here and there the face of someone her own age. Unlike her, they seemed to be able to weave expertly through the people, going whichever way they wanted. After what seemed like hours, Violet found herself free of the crowd. It was dark now, or almost dark. It was hard to tell because the massive iron bulk of the elevated railway covered the sidewalk and part of the street like a roof and electric signs over shop windows turned everything an eerie orange. New York was huger than Violet had imagined, and she had no idea how she was going to find Chloe. She was beginning to wish she'd never left Susquehanna. The sounds of ragtime music jingled from some of the shops, and men in loose-fitting suits and straw boater hats lounged around the doorways. From one shop with a sign out front that said, Barbizon Wigs, Best Quality, Violet heard a woman singing along with the Nickelodeon tinnily playing a song that had been popular a few months ago. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've gone seen Paris? How are you going to keep them from disappearing, jazzing around and painting the town? How are you going to keep them away from harm? That's a mystery. As Violet passed a group of men lounging in front of a candy store, one of them reached out and grabbed her arm. Hey baby, come on in and dance with me. Let's shake a leg. Let go of me! Violet kicked at his shins. She thought he smelled strongly of liquor, but that couldn't be. Alcohol had been illegal in the United States ever since the Volstead Act took effect in January. The stupid man just laughed, but one of the others shoved him and said, Cheese it, Stan. That ain't no broad. That's just a kid. Turn the page. Page 36. Stan let go. Frightened and disgusted, Violet hurried away. After that, she stayed well away from the doorways, skirting inside the L's giant iron legs. She kept walking fast. She didn't know where she was going, but she didn't like where she was. A train thundered overhead, making the iron frame of the L creak and the sidewalk under Violet's feet tremble. There was an enormous crashing roar as if the L were collapsing. Coal smoke filled her lungs and made her eyes smart. Violet stumbled blindly, unable to see but desperate to get out from under the crumbling elevated. Panicking, she stumbled into the street and slipped on something. She skidded, flailing her arms, trying to stay balanced. Then she hit the pavement with a smack that rattled her teeth. It took her a moment to catch her breath enough to smell what she'd slipped on. Horse dung. A, gr a hand grabbed her arm. Hey! Are you trying to get run over or what? Violet was ready to give up on New York. She had a confused idea that the easiest way to do that was just to stay where she was. Getting up was painful. She climbed gingerly onto the curb. Someone was brushing vigorously at the back of her skirt. Now your dress is all dirty. Violet turned to see who had pulled her out of the gutter. It was a black girl. Colored, Violet corrected herself. Nice people said colored. 
The girl only came up to Violet's shoulder, but she was dressed in a maid's uniform, a blue and white striped old-fashioned dress that came almost to her ankles, a white apron that tied behind with a big bow, and a quaint little mob cap that looked like it belonged two centuries in the past. One small braid had worked its way free from the cap. A badge on her dress said, Girls Training Institute. Page 37. Are you all right? said the girl, who was still brushing Violet off. Yes, I'm all right, but the L just collapsed. Wasn't anybody hurt? Violet looked around fearfully, expecting to see wreckage and smoke. The girl glanced over Violet's shoulder. The L wasn't collapsing. It was just going by, she said, sounding amused. Violet turned and saw to her embarrassment the dark outline of the L track behind her, apparently intact. You must not be from around here, said the girl, looking at Violet critically. Where are you trying to get to? The Henry Street Settlement House, said Violet. Boy, are you lost, said the girl. Come on. She took Violet's arm and led her down the street. My name's Myrtle Davies. What's yours? Violet had never been introduced to a colored person before, let alone introduced herself. She decided to say the same thing she had to Mrs. Renwick. I'm Miss Violet Mayhew of Susquehanna, Pennsylvania. Susquehanna, Pennsylvania? No wonder you're... Turn the page. Page 37. No wonder you're lost, said Myrtle. I'm surprised they let you out on your own. You're out on your own, Violet pointed out, irritated. Myrtle looked a lot younger than Violet. But I know my way around, said Myrtle, and I'm city-born. I grew up in D Washington, D.C. Grew up? Violet thought was an exaggeration. The girl couldn't be older than eight. What are you doing in New York then? I was sent here to attend the Girls Training Institute. Myrtle said the last three words in a high nasal sing-song that communicated quite clearly that she loathed the place. We cross here. Stop! Myrtle grabbed the square collar of Violet's blouse just as a steam-powered automobile zoomed down the street. What are they training you for? Violet asked. Nothing, said Myrtle with a shrug, sidestepping a mound of horse manure. I try not to spend too much time there, to tell the truth. Well, but is it a school, said Violet, getting irritated again, or what? It's supposed to be a school, Myrtle shrugged again. It trains colored girls to be maids. They sent me here because the training institutes in D.C. won't take girls my age. I'm ten, and they said you have to be twelve. Who sent you, said Violet, thinking that Myrtle barely looked eight, let alone ten. But she'd heard all her life that colored people were different, so maybe they grew differently. Your parents? Page 39. My parents are dead, said Myrtle. The ladies at church sent me. Oh, it was getting dark. They turned into a narrow street with wagons parked all along both sides of it. Some were unhitched. The dark shapes of horses fidgeted and stamped between the shafts of others. Buildings loomed overhead, and most of the streetlights were broken. Violet suddenly felt cold, even though it was an August night. This whole street seemed foreign and dangerous and smelled overwhelmingly of horseradish. To distract herself, Violet said, Don't you want to be a maid, then? Would you? asked Myrtle. Of course not, said Violet. She had an odd feeling that Myrtle's situation was a little like her own, except that Violet had a marriage looming in front of her, and Myrtle had been a maid. But they were both caged in by other people's plans for them, with no hope of escape, except that Violet was escaping. I'm sorry about your parents, Violet added belatedly. She thought about what it must be like to have both your parents dead. Father rarely spoke to her, and Mother was mostly in the business of handing out rules. They were never warm or friendly like parents she'd read about in books. Still not having them would make the world a very strange place, like a house with a roof. Thank you, said Myrtle, with dignity. The sharp pickles and onions smell cut through the... Turn the page. Page 40. The sharp pickles and onions smell cut through the horseradish and manure, and Violet realized how hungry she was. 
She looked around for the source. There, Violet saw a pushcart on two huge wooden wagon wheels, topped by a big canvas umbrella. A kerosene lantern hanging from the umbrella pole shed just enough light for Violet to make out the words painted on the side. Hot dogs, lemonade. The warm light from the lantern made the street seem less scary. Let's get a hot dog, Myrtle, Violet said. I don't have any money, Myrtle said. That's okay, I do. Violet turned to the hot dog seller, a man in a long white apron and plaid cloth cap. Two hot, er, how much are they, please? Five cents each, the man said. He had a foreign accent. Five cents for lemonade. You gotta drink it here, though, cause I only got the one glass. Violet looked at the smudged glass, which he held out for her inspection, and at the open bucket of lemonade hanging on the side of the cart. She was thirsty, but... Two hot dogs, please, she said. The man took a sharp iron knife and slit two buns, then delicately plucked two red, spicy-smelling sausages out of the cart with his fingers. He slathered them with mustard and ketchup and forked sauerkraut and fried onions on top of them. There you go, miss. Don't drop them. Violet had always been taught that the only that only the very lowest of the wrong sort of people ate on the street, and Myrtle had apparently been taught the same thing. They walked for a minute in silence, breathing the delicious smell of onions. Violet's stomach growled. In here, Myrtle said. They stepped into a narrow alley crisscrossed with clotheslines overhead and gobbled the hot dogs out of public view. Violet thought nothing had ever tasted better. End of chapter 3 Homework. Read chapter 3, pages 31 through 41, then record summary notes in the left box at the bottom of the reader's guide for the Hope Chest, chapters 3, Meeting Myrtle. Number two, as you reread the chapter, look for unfamiliar words whose meaning you may be able to infer by using synonyms and antonyms. Number three, use sticky notes to mark the page where the word is and write the synonym and antonym for that word. Let's review how to fill out the Somebody In Wanted But So Then summary notes. The somebody is the character or the narrator in a text. In is the place where the text is set. Wanted is what the character or the narrator is hoping for. But is the problem or the obstacle that might get in the way of what the narrator or the character wants. So is the outcome or resolution. And then is what happens to move the story forward. Somebody, again, is Violet. The setting of chapter 3 begins in New York City. Again, the year is 1920. That's what you're going to put in your summary notes. What Violet wanted was to find her sister at the Henry Street Settlement House. But she didn't know where the house was, and she was lost in the big city, and she had no money. So that's what we're going to put in the box labeled but. While she was walking around trying to figure out what to do next, she was scared by the train going overhead, and she slipped and fell. And that's when she met a girl named Myrtle, who helped her up out of the ditch. Then, the two girls ate a hot dog and started walking towards the settlement house. Pause the video if you need more time to complete the work on your homework.
end of chapter three.